in this video, I'll be going over the top five reasons that I hate stupid Range Rover. So as the title says, this is a Range Rover Evoque, mine is specifically a 2013, and I got it for an incredible deal. I've always wanted one. They've always caught my eye because of the design and the styling. I said, you know what? I wanna own one. I know how to drive vehicles for free and even profitably. And the case with this one is that I should make a proper killing driving it for a few months. So I bought it and there are some things that I love. I made a video on that, but there are also some huge downsides, some things that I absolutely hate. And I would say the things that I hate about this far outweigh the things that I like. So let's get onto those. The five things that I hate about the Range Rover Evoque, starting with number one, which is the visibility. I said the styling was sleek, but man, when you have tinted windows like this, for starters, and when you just have like the design and the shape of the uh, of the car, you can see the front window is the biggest. We have the huge pano roof, but it slides down. And as you can see in the back, it's already starting to get clustered and there's not too much visibility. I'll pop, I'll pop my head through the back here. Uh, and there's just really no visibility uh, once you account for the headrest, these tiny windows back here, and then a tiny little slit uh, basically from here to here. That's all you can really see out of the rear glass of this thing. So the visibility of this gets a huge thumbs down and that's probably the best con. Everything else is far worse. So let me tell you about those. Yep. <clears throat> Number two, if you're feeling blue. Number two, if you're feeling blue, is this preposterous, horrific Range Rover tax. So as you can see, I got into a little, uh, little accidente. Actually, I didn't, but the previous owner did. That's why I was able to buy this thing for an incredible deal. And it had a broken axle, broken lower control arm, and has a little bit of scuffing right here on the uh, front bumper. There's a scuff on this mirror and then there's a, a broken bit of plastic on this fender. So the fender needs to be replaced. This needs to be resprayed. I need a new plastic piece right here. The front bumper needs to be resprayed and I already got a new lower control arm and axle. I knew that I was getting into a project when I bought it. So I was able to price out all of these fixes before diving in and finally jumping into, uh, into this vehicle. But it was crazy to see the difference between OEM, Land Rover, Range Rover parts and aftermarket. Same with mechanical work, taking it to a shop, how much each and every single shop wanted to price gouge simply because of what it said right here. The Range Rover tax is real, it was crazy. I think it was 1600 bucks for the axle and uh, 800 for the control arm. Uh, I don't even, I didn't even check on the body panel for the new fender, uh, but I got all three of those things, the fender, the axle, and the lower control arm for $500 aftermarket, and then called up a mobile mechanic to come install it for 220 as a portable labor. It took them a couple hours. It took them a couple hours to do the job. So they still made over $100 an hour well worth their time but this is fundamentally no different than a different vehicle yes i understand parts cost may differ because oem markup or if there's a technical work that needs to be done like a desmo service on a ducati being more nuanced than the service on a japanese bike like i fully understand paying for knowledge and insight and someone who knows how to do the proper work on a highly specialized technical and advanced machine. That's why servicing a Ferrari or Lamborghini costs more than other vehicles from different manufacturers. However, when you're doing something that's simply like a 26 millimeter bolt and maybe a half inch, quarter inch, whatever, standard sockets with basic work, I don't think there should be a Range Rover tax, but the reason that shops wanna charge so much for the job is because they see, oh, it's a broken Range Rover that doesn't drive. So we can just milk this guy for all the money he has and charge him the Range Rover tax. And I hate it. Same for going and getting quotes for bodywork for this thing. Everyone wanted to tax the heck out of me simply because I pulled up in a Range Rover. All right, so those were the first two I'll hop in and we will talk about number three through five. So these are drivetrain issues, uh, actual issues, and I'm gonna get the seatbelt on so that all of you don't tear me to shreds in the comments about not wearing my seatbelt. Anyway, we'll put it in drive, we'll even put it in sport mode and get rolling. 
uh, for number three, which is the fuel economy on this thing. So now we're driving and one thing, one quick clarification I do wanna make, I was talking about the OEM versus aftermarket parts and I know I'll probably get some flack and some slack in the comments about, oh, you're using junk parts on your range, aftermarket's not gonna hold up, OEM's always the best, blah, 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 no. And to that I say, I got the axle put on, I got the lower control arm put on, and then I went off-roading in this thing. Uh, I went on a jump and I took it off-roading. Like, I put this thing through its paces, I tested out the axle, I tested out the lower control arm. It was fine. I'm sure it won't even get that sort of use and abuse by the next owner if they fit the, uh, the stereotype of whoever's buying this anyway. So for anyone who wants to like start something in the comments saying, oh, you're cheaping out with aftermarket parts. No, there's just a horrible Range Rover tax on the OEM parts because the manufacturers know that they can get away with it. Anyway, end rant, end tirade. Let's go with the next point, which is the fuel economy. The fuel economy of this thing is horrible. And now we're gonna couple this with the next points uh, about the engine, but the fuel economy on this is pretty atrocious. It's a two liter, I think, four cylinder engine. Uh, so it should be good, but it is just not. It doesn't get good gas mileage. And on top of that, it requires premium fuel because it's turbocharged and because it's a European vehicle. And so uh, the running costs are really, really high on top of not really getting far with a tank of gas. Uh, so that's point number three. And now the big heavy hitters are the engine and the trans. Those are number four. Those are numbers four and five. So we'll start off with the engine just because we're talking about uh, fuel consumption. The engine in this thing is, it's not the worst, but man, it stinks. I'm going downhill right now. So if I hit it, I'm sure it would be a little bit quicker, uh, but it's a dog. It's like I said earlier, a two liter four cylinder. It is turbocharged. Uh, so it should have some more pep and it should be adequate. Now I'm not asking for a race car with this at all, but man, it's a dog. From low speeds, the takeoff is pretty slow. This is due also to the trans, which I'll get to. Uh, from from mid-range, it's okay. It's kind of punchy at probably 30 if you had to pass someone. But on the highway, it's just too large of a vehicle for, for this very small engine to move as it should. Now, this would be completely fine and even merited if we were talking about one of the cheaper competitors, a uh, RAV4, a Rogue, a forerunner, anything domestic or uh, maybe Japanese that comes in at a lower price point that's not meant to be fully refined and like an Autobahn cruiser. But with something like this, uh, with it being, with it having such a nice interior and being such a pricey vehicle, especially uh, to buy new at MSRP, I would want it to be a little bit peppier or a little bit faster, especially on the freeway, able to cruise because you're really ringing this engine out uh, when you're going these highway speeds. You're cruising at 80 and this thing has a hard time, I don't want to say keeping up, but the ability to pass or to do any sort of maneuver like that if you had to or if you wanted to uh, would be tough. Not that I would ever speed or condone speeding to any of you, uh, to any of you at all. Anyway, that's gonna lead us to point number five, which is probably the worst, uh, definitely the worst, and that is the transmission in this thing. It's weird, I don't like driving it in uh, standard drive. I always drive it in sport. Um, that way it gives me the power that I want because like I said, the, the engine's pretty slow and doggy. I'm gonna rip a little loop-de-loop -loop because I don't know where I'm going. I'm just talking to you while I drive. It's an absolute dog. The shift points are weird. I will, uh, I'll put it in standard drive and we'll, we'll couple the engine, uh, the engine's low power output with this, but I'm gonna floor it. I'm not gonna launch it, but I'll floor it here and you can see it takes forever to take off. Turbo finally kicks in. We're finally getting up to speed. And the, the shift is crisp. I mean, there's not a fault or a flaw with the transmission itself in this particular model. I'm just saying the transmissions in these were built to be really slow uh, from the get-go and kind of slow to shift. So I'm almost always driving this thing in sport mode, but then the... Uh, I'm almost always driving this thing in sport mode, which I'm sure attributes to the lower gas mileage. Don't dox me on that one. Uh, anyway, the the transmission's still slow and sluggish and the shift points are weird and kind of convoluted, especially in drive. It doesn't know when it wants to, to 
downshift, when you put your foot down, it takes forever to shoot down the gear to accelerate uh, and get up to speed. Now I'll go over to a stoplight here and we can test out the zero to 60, fully launching it in sport mode as quick as we can go with this trans, with this engine. And you know what? I'll even give it a downhill advantage. Just so you can see, this thing does not like to get moving at all. We'll floor it, take off. Luckily, the all-wheel drive system is great. Uh, that's what I talked about in the top five. So now we're at 70 downhill. That wasn't too bad. Like I was saying though, the all-wheel drive system isn't bad, um, but the, the other elements of the drivetrain kind of stink. So we're in sport mode now. I understand why it's in the high gear. We'll drop it back to drive. It'll downshift or it'll upshift and everything's fine. But at this next stoplight, I'll drive like a normal sane human being and just show you where the shift points are. They're kind of weird. They're kind of convoluted. They're not the greatest and I hate the trans. So the light's green and, and I'll get on the gas just a normal moderate amount. And you can see after that shift, it's a little bit doggy. It's a little bit sluggish. Same there. Not a huge fan of the trans, not a huge fan of the trans, and yes, I'm setting a higher standard and a higher expectation because of the base MSRP and the sticker on this vehicle specifically, but I think for, but I think for the money that you're shelling out on one of these, you should have a superior drivetrain, not only in terms of the all-wheel drive system, but also in terms of the engine and the trans. So when you put the engine, the trans, the horrible fuel economy, the uh, the low visibility, and whatever I said that was number two, uh, the Range Rover tax on maintenance, on parts, on fixing everything, it's, it's not my favorite. I don't foresee myself owning this for an extended period of time. It's a blast. It's nice. Uh, it's cool that I've been able to own one, to drive one, to experience one, and the best part about it is that I'm not going to be losing. And the best part about this is that I'm able to own it, experience it, see if I like it uh, without losing any money because I have the know-how, the strategy, and the technique to do that. Like I said, I got a really good deal. Uh, and shameless plug, if you're interested in learning how to get good deals on vehicles, they can be uh, slight fixer uppers like this one, or they can have no problems at all. You just need to know how to buy such that you can drive for absolutely free at no net cost. Then click the link down below to the arbitrage program that I've created. It'll teach you everything you need to know to be able to drive for free. Uh, but that is the top five things that I hate about this car. Hopefully you liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Drop a comment down below if you own one of these uh, and you're like, yeah, preach. Preach into the choir here. This thing kind of sucks in the drivetrain, in the gas mileage department. Visibility is horrible. Uh, or, if, or if you've been thinking of one and not been able to test drive one, uh, and you're kind of being dissuaded by this, I totally understand. And that's what I'm making this video for. I'm not sponsored by Land Rover, Range Rover, whatever. This is my personal vehicle. I've had some time and experience with it. So I just wanted to say this is what's good. This is what's bad. And with that in mind, I will see you on the next one. Peace.